this lecture we're going to learn what science is and what science is not. Science is a body of knowledge, right? It's basically we have all of these facts and different observations and all of the discoveries that we have about nature and our universe. And we really build upon the previous knowledge that others have already gained. And this is known as building upon the shoulders of giants. So for this course and also for our lives, scientific literacy is really important so that we can operate effectively in this world. Now, there are some words that are used in science that are sometimes misunderstood. And the first one is scientific hypothesis. Many times people think a hypothesis is simply just, just a guess. But it's actually more than that. It's an educated guess about processes in the physical world that are consistent with current understandings. And so there's an example, you know, if a bacterial species is exposed to low doses of, anti of an antibiotic, then an antibiotic resistance can evolve. And that's an example of a hypothesis. Now, hypotheses must be testable. Think to yourself, what does that mean? It means that there is some observation that could prove the hypothesis false. Notice that we never prove anything true in science Rather, we can only falsify in science. Now, another word that is sometimes confused is fact. And a fact is simply an observation that can be repeatedly confirmed over and over again. So you can measure, for example, the length of the forewing of this dragonfly, and maybe you say it's 42 millimeters long. Or you can go to Hawaii and take the temperature and say that it's 15 degrees Celsius. But what's interesting is that our observations are always gathered by our senses, which cannot be entrusted entirely. In fact, observations can change with better technologies or with better ways of looking at the world. For example, if I were maybe measured now the forewing with a laser ruler, maybe the actual length with the laser ruler is 52.001 millimeters. And so therefore, this fact now becomes obsolete. So it's ironic that in science actually facts are more susceptible to change and to, mo and to being shown not to be true than theories are. So this brings us to the word of theory. Theory provides this broad understanding of the dynamic processes in nature and they're supported by large amounts of evidence accumulated from different sources. I love this quote where it says, in science, theories do not turn into facts through the accumulation of evidence. Rather, theories are the endpoints of science. I also like to think of it this way. Okay, so here's a theory. What goes into a theory? Well, observations, facts, predictions, tested hypotheses, laws, and every other thing that you can basically think of in science goes into a theory. So another quote that I really like that summarizes this is that theories are the crown of science, for in them our understanding of the world is expressed, the function of theories is to explain. In kind of my dumbed down language, I would say, theories are as good as it gets. There is nothing better than a theory in science. So science then, as a way of knowing, has to always be um, used to explain the natural world. Science cannot touch or explain the supernatural. And this is because science, once again, is testable against only the empirical world. Now, we do gain lots of knowledge, but regardless, all of that knowledge still remains tentative because we never prove anything true. We can only prove things false in science. It is only falsifiable. So we never say for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure that something is true. What we can say is that we are very confident that this is the correct answer and this is the way that this system works. Now, in science, there are basically two ways of gaining knowledge. One is discovery science, and this is kind of the natural history. You go out, make observations and collections and so forth. And the second is the hypothesis-driven science. In the hypothesis-driven science, you're familiar with this process. It's where you make an observation, you question, like, why doesn't the flashlight work? Well, one hypothesis, maybe the flashlight, it doesn't have batteries. So I make a prediction, and predictions are always if-then statements. If I change the batteries, then the flashlight will work. Okay, so I test that. Oh, it didn't work. 
So now I make a new hypothesis, and I've proven the old hypothesis false, the hypothesis that the flashlight does not work because the batteries are old. So now I do a new hypothesis, and maybe the hypothesis is the flashlight, is the uh, bulb is burned out. Okay, so I, my prediction is if I change the bulb, the flashlight will work. I test it, the flashlight works, and therefore that prediction um, was shown to be uh, correct, and so therefore the hypothesis is supported. Now, knowledge then uh, in science must come to the point where it becomes scientific consensus, and that's when it becomes a very strong idea in science. And the only way that this happens is that that claim, so someone has an idea, they've tested it, they've done, uh, made observations, they've done lots of those two types of um, initial scientific endeavors, but then it must be subjected to critique. And this is done by peer review. Once knowledge claims have made it through peer review, then they can become um, scientific consensus. Or if the, the other peers decide this is not a good idea and they, show, they can maybe do other experiments to show that the idea is not a good idea, then it can be rejected. So good ideas are kept and bad ideas are rejected. And that's the way science works. It's continually getting rid of bad ideas and continually supporting good ideas. So science is not a democracy. Science does not come from the revelation. The only authority in science is the empirical world. There's no unexplained exceptions, no value judgments, doesn't rely on faith, and there's no accepted tradition. Science looks at ideas, and if they're good, they are kept, and if they are not, they are thrown out. Now, there are other, there are other ways of knowing. For example, many people can uh, accept the fact that they can gain knowledge through authority. Like in my household, I have certain rules. My kids know you don't do this. And that may be different in someone else's house, but in my house, that is the knowledge. Um, many people belong to religious organizations or political organizations or whatever, and there may be knowledge that can gain through an authoritative figure. Democracy sometimes decides on knowledge. For example, how fast you can tr drive your car down the road. <laughs> Consensus. Sometimes uh, knowledge is decided upon by everyone agreeing upon a decision. Many people rely or believe in the fact that revelation or inspiration can, can provide knowledge. I love uh, art and I love music and I you know, love to be able to go to a museum and just stare at art paintings and sculptures and I really think you can gain insights from doing that and so I, I think many people would, would argue that there is knowledge that we can gain aesthetically or even morally there is knowledge that we can gain and ethical knowledge as well. The point is there's lots of different ways of gaining knowledge. Science does not have a monopoly on knowledge so therefore science is limited in its power. Now, even though it is limited, it is still very powerful, especially at explaining the natural world. So many people ask, well, can these separate ways of acquiring knowledge coexist? I may differ with some colleagues on this, but I think so. I think that one can gain knowledge in art and one can gain knowledge in science. So science is definitely then a way of knowing. And in science, we can ask questions about the natural world. So what science, though, cannot do is try to assign meaning to these things or make decisions about morality or, you know, explain God or tell you what to do with your life. These are the types of areas where you would want to go to the other ways of gaining knowledge to make decisions.